So hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me here. And it's a pleasure to be in front of you and talking with you guys. So what I'm going to talk about today is DevNet. And I'll give you a small overview of DevNet. But the main thing that I want to show you is the art of possible with what you can do with DevNet. So in today's talk, uh, there are three things that I really want you to take away. Okay. So the first thing is that I want you to learn something new that you did not know before. The second thing is that you will know the best kept secret of Cisco. And the third one is like you're going to make a new friend today. And we'll see how, how the talk goes, and then we can continue. So let's start. Uh, this is my agenda for today. And like, you know, I'll, I'll go over all these uh, things. Uh, so I'll talk about myself. I'll give you a DevNet boot camp. Uh, I'll talk about co-creations. Uh, and then like, let's like, you know, have questions. And then you feel free to ask me questions anytime. Uh, and then let's geek out with some of the solutions that we've built. So let me start off uh, by giving you a brief introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Ashutosh Malegaonkar. Uh, this is my 20th year in Cisco. Uh, I probably might not look that that much, but you know, like uh, this is this that's the fact. Uh, I've done a lot of like platforms. I've done ISR as one of uh, ISR is my baby, uh, and I've done voice video. Uh, I've done two startups inside Cisco in the ETG realm, uh, and then I got to be one of the founding members inside DevNet. Uh, so that's me. Uh, the first thing, like you know, one of the things that I I like to tell about me is that I am a person first, uh, and then everything else. I'm an engineer second. So uh, wherever I am, like you know, you'll you'll see me uh, talking about my like you know persons versus engineering. So that's me. Uh, the third thing is I lead what we call as DevNet co-creations, uh, and we'll get into it what it is. But essentially, it is something that. It's a new program that we started recently where we work with our strategic partners and customers and, and developers to build out new solutions. Uh, these are my like LinkedIn and Twitter handles. And the main thing is that I really love what I do. Uh, so that's basically me. So let's get started. So before like you know, I, I want to give you a brief overview or an introduction of what DevNet is. So DevNet, you know, like if you think like Cisco has a lot of platforms, uh, like you know, we've been ha we've had hardware platforms, software platforms, and one of the things that is coming out in the last few years is like most of these platforms have started having APIs. So something that like where once I could just go in through a CLI and do things, now I have the ability to actually go through an API and config configure the the routers or the switches, or in fact like you can build solutions as part of the ecosystem. So APIs are, are becoming the, the big, big thing. So DevNet definitely saw this uh, four, four and a half years back. So we built a program called DevNet, which is the developer program for Cisco. Uh, it's pretty much similar to what we have at, uh, let's say, Apple. Like Apple has developer.apple.com, and it like brings in all the developers and build applications. Something similar is what this DevNet is about. Now, apart, like w once we have the DevNet as a developer program, we have a bunch of like you know offers uh, that we have. So we basically are able to like see like help and like work with our developers and partners to make them successful. And I'll, I'll be walking you through some of those uh, next. But the main one of the highlights that I want to actually give here is. We, as as we mentioned at the beginning, that we have reached uh, like 500,000 developers uh, this week, and that's a huge huge thing for DevNet because and Cisco. This is pretty cool. We have around 33,000 companies. Uh, these are like developers from different companies who actually are part of our DevNet. They come on come to our sites regularly. They they either take learning labs or our sandboxes that I'll talk about. And then, like we have uh, around 60 to 70,000 developers who are pretty much active with with DevNet monthly. Now, 
uh, in terms of the offers, uh, so like if you look at the offers, the first one is about API experience. And when I say API experience, one of the things that like developers really want to do is not look at PDFs, right? They don't want to look at uh, like something that's out there. They want to see the documentation. They want to actually try that documentation out in live, right? So that's what uh, the whole a API experience is all about. And it's not just the experience of the API, but what we have done inside DevNet is we have actually created two categories of like developers. One is like the infrastructure developers. So these are our traditional networkers. Uh, they want to actually like automate, they want to like do more things with the networking gear. Then there are these app developers uh, who come in and they say, hey, you know, like I am a Meraki shop. Uh, I've bought Meraki. Can I actually create something with Meraki APIs. So these are not traditional network people, but these are app developers who want to use those APIs. So that's that's the other, the, so that's the API experience where we actually cater our site to both these categories as well. The second thing is the DevNet Sandbox. And this has been a huge success. Uh, and one of the things that we offer here is we offer people a free hardware where they can come in and try out our APIs. So for example, like let's say that I have, let's say a call manager. And a call manager, I have it in, installed in my like enterprise. What I want to do is like maybe try out a new configuration. So, and I cannot do it in my live system. So what I would do is like go to the sandbox, put my configuration there and see how, how, how that works. Now Sandbox has like two types. One is like a regular 24 seven, uh, it's open, anybody can go in and try it out. Second thing there is like, you know, we, there's a reserved uh, slot. So you can actually reserve your Sandbox for like four or five hours and try out your configuration. You can wipe clean the whole configuration, you can try it out, uh, so that, that's the second one. And, and that's where, like I said, like a lot of our partners, what they have started doing is, and these are our traditional partners, like, you know, Die Data, WWT, they come in, they try out some of the applications with the, the latest uh, code or maybe the latest hardware. So we even have a 9K uh, in there. Uh, we have a lot of things like our partnership with Google. So we have a Kubernetes cluster oh, at, at that point. So people can come and try out those things. The third thing is about training and like teaching. And this is very important because a lot of our networkers are transitioning from where they were to the API world. And they, they definitely need that handholding. So right from having like, you know, a, a Python 101 class or a Kubernetes 101 class to actually like setting up your whole network uh, is what is taught in these, uh, these uh, tutorials. Uh, we recently launched a video tutorial where like we call it Net DevOps, where like Hank, who's one of our evangelists, like what he's done is like he takes uh, an example of how to configure your whole network and there's a whole section, I mean whole video series uh, for that. Now uh, in the learning as well, uh, one of the things that you'll see is developers, uh, they, they have two things in mind, right? One is uh, that they need to have a building block or a starting point. So they need code to say, oh, tell me how this application really works or how does this API work? So we need to provide them with sample applications. So that's something that we do. The second thing that developers need is, and need is, is, a, is basically like, if it works the first time, they get hooked onto it. And we actually have created what we call as the code exchange, where we, like, you know, we, it's curated code repositories where people can come in and, like, search for, let's say, like DNA. So if I search for DNA on a regular GitHub, what happens is you'll see DNA sequencing, DNA, all sorts of repositories show up. Versus, like, if you come to the DevNet code exchange and you search DNA, you will actually see repositories which are relevant and, like, these are vetted. Ha, like source code that you can take a look at and start using it. So that's the learning and coding. Uh, the next thing is about the ecosystem. I'll come back to co-creations in a minute. But once our developers start developing their applications uh, with, with using code exchange, they build their stuff. We are we have a, 
a concept where we have the ecosystem exchange where partners can come in and like actually start selling their solutions as part of like the ecosystem so like for example like there is a small partner that we worked with he he uses like the meraki api, API uh, apis and he is now uh, on the meraki partner list where he can actually wherever meraki is sold he can actually sell his solution as part of his uh, like as part of the deal or the customer has a preview to what's available with with the meraki apis the last one is co-creations and this is what uh, we'll talk about in detail uh, this is where like you know cisco and apple have had uh, like partnerships uh, google has partnerships with cisco uh, what we do is we work with our strategic partners as well as like you know customers who are like you know top top tier customers and see what are the requirements that they have and work with their teams so that we can co-create something new uh, with them so that's what co-creations is all about so at this time like you know i would basically have like pause for a minute and see if you have any questions on anything that i talked about awesome what's what's the relationship between devnet and dclub so there is there is really the the there is no relation the relationship is that dcloud has demos uh, like a lot of the demos are actually hosted over there they don't have learning material right uh, they don't actually like teach you how to actually figure out oh this is how dna works this is the api that uh, gets called those are the kind of things that like that's that's the difference but more on the on the back end is devnet running on dcloud infrastructure or is it no, just a totally no it's a it's a totally separate infrastructure gotcha Okay, so as I said, uh, like you know, so DevNet co-creations is like uh, we are a team of developers. Uh, we like have evangelists. We also have like design thinkers. Uh, and one of the things that we also do is uh, we are very heavy on design thinking in DevNet, where we like if you have we have a workshop, a design thinking workshop, we understand what is the problem that we are trying to solve. We actually go through that process of design thinking. come up with a solution and prototype it uh, and that basically we do it with hand holding with the customer maybe customers customer developers are also with us and we can actually continue doing that and if you go to the devnet zone like we have uh, like uh, today like we have verizon uh, a lady from verizon who runs their experience lab she's here with us and like she's helping us out on uh, the design thinking so one of the things is that it's we started off with our strategic partners uh, but slowly like you know we are uh, started working with bigger customers as well and partners and little startups that that come through our, like come through cisco uh, ecosystem as well like you know we we help them on on that so the devnet community as i said right uh, is is full of like you know the big names bdi data cdw wwt procedio and like some of them like you know some of the people who work at these they are what we call as really fiercely loyal devnet members they come in they actually help out on our like social like even our, in our support uh, uh, groups so they come in and they say hey we've solved this here's here's an answer so lot of lot of the people are active in in this community so it, it's a very good thing because now we have like not just devnet people but we also have a lot of like you know the community helping out as well so that's that's the devnet community so uh, that's that so again any questions on anything okay so let's let's like you know geek out on some 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 solutions okay so let i'm going to start off with location services uh, so for people who who know or don't know location services this is just a, a refresher so location services like uh, is taking our access points and doing triangulation on a device and figuring out the location of the device uh, so if i have my phone here i have three aps uh, the 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 meraki i mean not meraki the location services api will tell me that this device is located in the corner of this room uh, so they know the x and y location of of our uh, position it also does ble uh, so for example on our cisco badges you see that like there is 
a BLE tag, uh, and the, this BLE tag uh, will is is like tells you the location of where that person is. Now, what we have done is we have actually built a, a, a solution called Glance, and this was actually built for uh, a big big customer Lowe's. Uh, so this is and it was deployed at the Lowe's uh, site in North Carolina. So the way the use case was that this was a 3D graph where what what happens is one of the problems that they were trying to solve is that as a customer, I walk in, and as soon as I walk in, what they wanted to see is like, I want to see, I want to meet a hardware person, or I want to talk about paint. So what this touch screen would do is, I would come here, I would see this touch screen, I would click on, like, there was a search button, and then the search button will say, okay, hardware. As soon as I see hardware, what ends up happening is, I see the experts who are the hardware experts on this map. And I know that, oh, there are like two people in the hardware zone. Let me click on one of them. So I click on one of them, and I can actually do a spark call uh, to that person from this endpoint to, to that person. Uh, in fact, like, you know, we also had where we can send out a text message uh, also so that we can say, hey, I, I'm coming there. Can you please hold on there? Right? So those are the kind of use. That is the first use case. The second use case was from the store manager point of view. Uh, so that was where the store manager knew, knew what his employees were doing. Uh, not just that, but there was also asset tracking that was happening. Uh, so we had like BLE tags uh, placed on some of their forklifts and stuff like that, where now they could actually find where like the forklift is at any given point. So that was the, from the store manager point of view. And then they also saw like, you know, uh, like heat maps of which are the places where a lot of people are like, you know, are coming together. So that, that gives them that idea of like, you know, what is happening in the store at any given point. Now, the thing, the, the thing to remember here is like, if you see like, you know, I talked about Cisco, two technologies. One is that I talked about Cisco uh, CMX, uh, which is at the bottom, we also used uh, WebEx Spark, uh, which is uh, WebEx Teams or Spark, uh, so we we use that, and then like Tropo, but uh, and Meraki. But the other thing that you see, if you build out the system, we have used a lot of open source to build out a solution to show like you know what is possible. So this is something where like the whole whole experience was built for for this customer, and we actually had it deployed uh, with that customer. So that was the first first example, and what I'll do now is quickly just uh, show you one one example. So if you see this, uh, this is a live live view of the Meraki building. Uh, it's deployed in uh, in San Francisco, and what you see here is that this is the sales office uh, sales zone. Sorry. So what you see. Sorry. So what you see here is like you'll see that in the sales department there are 388 devices. In the WebEx side there are 23 people. So these are devices at real time. And in fact, like if I click click on the photo of of this person, right? Let's say like I click on Eric, I can see his profile uh, in real like his expertise and not just his. Uh, his information, but what I can also do is send messages. So I can send out a Spark message, or I can send out a, a text message to that person. So this is something that, like you know, this is becoming more and more like relevant in in big offices. Now the other thing here, as I said, uh, is the analytics, uh, where you can actually see the heat maps that that come in. So like here in this case, you can see the heat map of like uh, this is a real time heat map of where the devices are at this point. So this is this is the uh, this is one. Uh, so this is something where like it works both on Meraki, it works on CMX, and uh, this is a solution that has been deployed uh, with with a real customer. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, so the next example that I want to give you is operational technology automation. So this is a customer that we worked with in in China. Uh, this customer is called BBA. It's the BMW subsidiary for China. 
the example, the what their problem was that they had robotic arms uh, which were generating a lot of sensor data, and that data was being stored in in in, in the data center uh, on a lot of on 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 the files. What happens is like once they are stored in the files, they wanted to have a very simple application for the operator. Uh, and again, you know, like for for people who deploy these new solutions, there's always that tension between IT and OT. So like the OT person wanted to have like uh, you know the right set of uh, capabilities to turn on the solution. So we built that application in order for them to 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 create that workflow for them. So what they wanted to do is get the data that's coming from the robotic arms. You take that data, parse it, and then based on the error codes or the error codes that you see, they wanted to connect those error codes with the right expert in in Germany. Uh, and one of the things was it was not just uh, like so one expert doesn't know everything. So they wanted to create the, these separate Spark rooms uh, or WebEx team rooms where they could actually send out uh, this information. I actually, I'm going to relay a couple questions in from Twitter. Is this all based on Meraki, or can this be used with regular Cisco Wireless? Uh, the previous, uh, the previous one, yes, it can be used with Meraki as well as regular CMX. Okay, and does it require location services like CMX, or is there just an API that you can call into? That requires location services. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So, so the second, so this was this was that solution. And the, the what we built for them was uh, this dashboard. Uh, this is this application was called uh, Dev IoT, but what it really did is it allowed the user or the operator to literally drag and drop uh, like these sensors or robotic arms on the dashboard. You can write a rule saying that if you see this error code, then send this out to the Spark room. And in fact, like if you see this Spark configuration, we literally had. Uh, an Excel sheet upload where people can say, if you see this error code, this is the room that you should create if it is not created. So a lot of automation was done as part of that, and it really helped the customer and Cisco to like you know take it to the next level. So uh, before I move on to the next one, are there any questions on this? Cool. So the third one is about the, the partnership between Cisco and Apple. So what we did recently is uh, like Cisco announced a partnership where uh, it is called Fastlane. Uh, so for people who don't know what Fastlane is all about, so if you have an iOS device uh, which is connected to a Cisco wireless network, and it could be a traditional wireless, it could be a Meraki wireless, what happens is the iOS, the appli application running on that iOS device can have network QoS tags. It can enable those tags right from the application. So uh, to give you an example, like if I have an hospital, uh, if I have a hospital where I have an application where there is a nurse, there's an application that does communication between the nurses and the doctors. Uh, I want to give higher priority to that application than like somebody who's watching, like, f like doing FaceTime or watching a YouTube video. So how do I do that? Is like I let that application be on the fast lane and then like the application developer has to say that hey you know like my application needs to be on the fast lane so what we did inside devnet is we created a fast lane validation program and what it really did is it brought in a lot of the apple developer ecosystem onto this validation lab so what happens is the the apple uh, enterprise developers uh, who are developing these applications, they come in with, with their application, they go through the whole validation process uh, with us, and at the end, they get, uh, if everything is uh, cool, then what ends up happening is they get the Cisco compatible logo. And Cisco compatible logo actually has a lot of weight in terms of like when you go to the customer, uh, et cetera. Now, if it, if it doesn't pass, what we do is we help those developers because one of the things that we realized as part of this process is, you know, when people come from the application world and you ask them, Q, you talk about QoS, uh, their first reaction is, 
what is that that's that's all there we don't even know what it is for them what is more important is the experience of the application so when we went through this process for each of these developers what really like helped us is like we worked with each one of them uh, and like help them go through the whole validation and this is like pretty cool because like now more and more developers are coming on board uh, as well uh, so we have like l a bunch of applications that have gone through like you know the validation uh, big tin can tulip retail sage patient safe uh, from apple so those are like and plus like all our cisco apps which are uh, like you know which are run on ios have have been validated as well so before before i move on to the next one uh, again i'll just pause for any questions what's the development time like on these types of custom applications yeah so what what we do is like based on like like the fast lane validation is it's more strategic so that is a program that runs even now so it's not like we stopped on it right so that continues but for glance for example like it took it it was a 6 month project uh, so we basically like right from understanding what it means we had a prototype in house but to to actually deploy it in the in the field it took us time so basically that's what we do and then like you know the i'll give you another example some of them like are like a month uh, to do it some of them uh, and this is what i'm showing is these are just examples but we have a lot more uh, where customers like uh, like for example very recently what we did is uh, target they wanted to have a workshop where they wanted to train their engineers uh, on net devops so we actually did that with them for a, as a two day workshop so it all depends on the type of uh, involvement that is needed Okay, so the next one is uh, uh, Meraki and Alexa. So this is like you know the simplifying IT use case, uh, and this is very uh, like you know pretty cool because one of the things that uh, okay before I go there like for Meraki like there are like three types of APIs. Okay, so the first one is about the dashboard APIs or management APIs. Uh, the second one is a scanning API or location, like you know, the location APIs are basically over here. Uh, and the third one is the splash screen API, where, like, for example, you walk into a Starbucks or a Pete's Coffee, like when you come in and like you say accept the conditions, uh, like that's what the splash page is. So like making it uh, personalizing uh, that page. So there are these three APIs. Now, one of the use cases uh, that uh, was was told was, hey, you know, like I run this coffee shop and Pete's Coffee is, is, is a customer where they say, hey, you know, like we, we have a coffee shop, but the people who come in and do the work every day, they are not tech savvy. Uh, what they wanted to do is have a simple way of uh, like going and saying, hey, you know, can I actually like start the guest Wi-Fi for today? Uh, so like very simple things, but now the use case was that I as, as that like person who's running the show, come in, I basically say, Alexa, can you start the guest Wi-Fi today? Uh, so it comes back and says, cool, I've started. Uh, can you change the guest Wi-Fi password for today? So it would change, and then it will actually say the password for you. So those are the kind of things that like, you can start enabling, and uh, like it, things that you know, like, it makes you and the customer happy as well. So uh, this is an example of that. Uh, there's a video as well, so you can go and check it out uh, online is it viewed as like a legitimate business use case or more of just like an interesting proof of concept uh, this is a this is a this is a interesting use case but the customer is using this uh, it's, really? yeah so and like you know i'll give you an example of like i mean i have uh, meraki at home and like you have friends come over right i mean a lot of times you have uh, like your friends ask you for hey what's the guest password right so instead of like keeping your guest wi-fi on you would just like do it in the house as well. So you know, like for it can be used in a lot of other places. Okay, so the last one uh, that I'm going to talk about today is uh, this is in regards to our partnership with Google. And uh, I'm sure like you'll be talking, somebody, some experts will be talking about the hybrid cloud. But uh, the thing that I want to give you, uh, give you an example of is like we have this hybrid cloud where uh, we, we recently announced a platform called CCP. 
Uh, what it, it essentially does is it is a Kubernetes cluster uh, on premise and it, it has a connection to the Go uh, Google Kubernetes cloud. Uh, so if I run a microservice which is uh, on, on the local CCP, then what I can do is I can call a microservice which is either in the, is hosted in GKE, I can call it locally, as well as if I have an application or a microservice running in the GKE, I can call something that's local on CCP. So it works both ways. So what we did here is one of the one of the problems that uh, we we actually did we uh, we heard is like in in a retail store uh, for example let's take uh, target.com or coles.com one of the things that they they told us is that hey you know like on their .com sites they are able to track the right like you know the where where the person is actually navigating to so I, they go on the home page uh, furniture, chair, they know exactly what they did. Versus like in a retail store, uh, it's not that easy. Uh, so people have tried a lot of things like, you know, even we've tried uh, the the CMX, for example, we've tried uh, uh, beacons, people have tried uh, like just video surveillance. So a lot of things have happened. And this was a problem like I said, okay, let's see if we can uh, have uh, do something with, with this. So what we did is uh, we have the edge, uh, we have the fog or the edge where uh, some of the things that we do is we take in the camera feeds. Uh, so these are IP cameras, Meraki cameras, and the third one I'm not sure whether everybody knows, but we have a 3800 AP where like it has a HDK. Uh, HDK stands for Hardware Development Kit. You can literally put in a Raspberry Pi on that AP. So just imagine that like you have an AP installation uh, anywhere, you could plug in your own custom hardware that does maybe sensing, it senses maybe like people, it senses cameras, you can do whatever you want. But for this uh, uh, project, what we have done is we've used a Raspberry Pi with a USB camera and that's acting as an input. And then we have written our service uh, over here. So the use case that I, I talked about is that once I come in into the store, I'm able to tell the flow of how I have navigated through the store. Okay, so for example, and this is anonymous, you don't really know, we don't store video, we don't store images, but this is pure like, you know, vectors that, that I'll talk about shortly. But you are able to see that uh, like whole flow of that person. In fact, like, you know, I would encourage you to come to the DevNet zone because I have it running live over there. So you can actually experience it for yourself as well. So, so again, uh, goes back to my use case. Uh, so we have the cameras at the base level and we have written a camera service. Now this camera service can reside anywhere. It could reside on an IP camera, it could reside on uh, a Raspberry Pi, it could reside even in the CCP. So if I have a lot of IP cameras, they're streaming that the camera service can get those streams and then from then onwards, it can do only images. So, uh, so as part of it, we do two things. The first thing it does is it does face uh, face detection. So for face detection is nothing but like, you know, showing like, yeah, in this frame, I see like five people and it draws that rectangle uh, over there. In the next one is face recognition where it will tell you that, oh, I recognize it as a face and then it also creates a, a vector for, for that face. And then once I have that vector, we put it in uh, the search engine and we wrote a search like, you know, it's a, it's a vector search engine because now one of the things that we want to do there is we want to figure out the, the distance between the, that vector. So for example, if I'm standing here right now, the camera sees me, uh, there's, that's one vector. I move to another room and the camera there sees me, it takes another vector. The vectors are not going to be the same at all, right? Because these are vectors, even if it's the same person, you have to find the closest match or the distance uh, vector. So we basically have, we've created a, a search engine on this and then like that is the application that will tell you some information. Now the way it gets used is that we have built a, an application on top which will call that one of the APIs and say, hey, like, you know, if I give it a photo, right, 
can you tell me like where this person has been? So, and this is a known person for now, right? I mean, I actually put in a photo, I take my photo and you can see that I have gone to location number one, two, three, four, like, you know, you can actually see that information. So like, uh, and that will help the, the retailer know like how people are navigating and that camera can be a, a mobile camera as well. So it can be actually sitting on the cart, it can be, you can actually get that information where people are stopping, uh, etc. So, uh, so that's, that's the use case and uh, like one of the things is like we are trying out uh, multiple things is like for example if I want to do like let's say let's take a store where it has multiple branches, I can have my application running in the cloud but then the local, uh, the actual vectors don't even go in the cloud. So they are stored in the, the data center of that enterprise. So what I can do is in the cloud, I can actually do a, a federated search and say, hey, uh, can you tell me like what type, where, where all this person has been? Uh, so, you know, you can actually see, oh, he went to tar target store number one, five and seven, you know, like those, those kind of uh, uh, use cases. So this is again. This is a. This is just an innovation project that we have started, uh, and uh, to show the art of possible using the Cisco Cloud Platform. Uh, the machine learning part of it is happening. Some of the machine learning is happening in the cloud, and we push the models as we see it uh, onto like different uh, like data centers. So this is this is an use case of showing how uh, hybrid cloud use cases can be done. So. Uh, like these were the demo links uh, I would like you to like to share. Like you know, I talked about Glance, uh, which was the CMX, uh, Alexa demo, and then the Fastlane uh, uh, demo as well. So there's a Fastlane demo. In fact, like one of the the demos like uh, we have here is on that page. Is as a developer, you can go in and create your own. Uh, demo uh, using the source code that you can download. So you can actually run that demo by yourself. So as I said before, right, you know, you learn three new things. I mean, three things. One is that you're going to learn something new. Uh, and I hope that, like, you know, you learned uh, something new from the use cases, how technology is getting used. Uh, we, I talked about Fastlane. I talked about the Google partnership and the hybrid cloud, uh, some of the retail use cases. I talked about, uh, like, you know, the TensorFlow. By the way, for the uh, uh, machine learning thing, I, we use TensorFlow to do face detection and face uh, uh, l recognition. So that was that. And then, like, you know, I hope that it's DevNet is no longer a secret for anybody of you. Uh, so this is like, you know, DevNet is like mainstream. Uh, so that's the secret that I wanted to tell you. And finally, like you have a new friend in me. So please connect with me and more than happy uh, to you. So at this point, I would be more than happy to take any questions, or if there are any questions online. Uh, yeah, actually, a question on the on the Cisco AP forty eight hundred that you've had on yes. the slides there. Yes. Yes. Um, so, what are you doing in um, uh, in respect to making some development for the modules themselves? Is that little picture you got down? Yeah. So this this uh, this module yeah. actually like you can order that HDK. Right. Uh, and what you can do is like for your development, you can put a Raspberry, in fact that the, the hardware module itself has, like you can literally plug in an, uh, like uh, a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino in there. Uh, so you can prototype very easily, but once you know your design, there is a standard interface that goes in. So what you get with that hardware is you get power and uh, ethernet uh, access. In fact, like that's the reason. That's how you can even secure uh, that that Raspberry Pi. Okay. And then, do you have like some sort of examples on how to yes. all of us all on DevNet? Yes, we have. Okay. And I can forward you those links as well. I know who who, who took that picture actually, so that's why okay. that, that was very familiar. Cool. Um, There's actually another delegate, uh, uh, Sam Clements. That's actually his. Um, but um, uh, another thing to do on the DevNet piece, um, and maybe is. How do we engage um, a lot of our younger audience, um, especially like, um, for example, my daughter? Mm -hmm. She's 11, and she's going on 12, and she wants to start yes. doing her own stuff. Like, how? What do you have, or um, or do you guys have plans to kind of help out the younger generation to kind of like get them on board, yes. like with some easy modules to kind of guide them through? Maybe you can yeah. On that. So just to like share share the pain 
that you have. I have two teenagers, uh, and like one of the things that uh, I see is uh, like you know on DevNet we have done two things. Okay, so one is that we have done uh, what we call as an Arduino 101 uh, workshop. Uh, in fact, like you know we have on the Cisco campus. Uh, what we have done is uh, we've started off that way, but where we have actually uh, like helped like. Uh, employ kids, bring in, let them come in, and they've used that to actually build out something. So that's how they, they start. Then the Dev IoT platform that I showed you uh, is is something that the NetAcad has uh, is wanting to start using with us, uh, so that they can. Because you remember, I told you it's a very simple drag and drop uh, application, where. Like my son, like he actually said that now he knows Dev IoT very, very well, and he knows IFTTT because of that, right? So those are the kind of things that are sparking some innovation in them. The the third one is uh, like you know very recently we started, uh, we have our own conference called DevNet Create, and in DevNet Create one of the things that we did was uh, it's called Camp Create, where we call developers to come in and uh, like take a look at some of the use cases and uh, like those are the use cases that we what we want to do next is next year we want to see if we can bring that general i mean the, the younger audience to come in and solve those use cases so we'll we'll teach them as part of that camp create what we do is we give them an overview of a technology and then they go and hack or try to come up with a solution so that's something that uh, we want to do and the last thing is that our learning labs, uh, we do have like you know Python 101 as as a course. Uh, so for people who want to literally start from something uh, from the basics, they can come in and start doing that as well. That's great. Uh, one last thing, the uh, sandbox you were talking about. Yes. The devices that are on there are they populated with some kind of like demo config that you can yes they they all, they're all conf they're all configured uh, either with real devices or what we do is we have simulators uh, which actually like generate events okay. uh, so for example like for dna the dna platform that that we have what we have done is like the dna team has actually come up with their own uh, event generator so for example like you don't have ap's going down every now and then so what they have done is that they've created a script that says okay i want to like simulate an ap going down and so that i can do something with it so it's not like it's a, a you know demo config just sitting there then no. it can change it can change it can change because if you reserve your sandbox then you can go change the configuration uh, to whatever you want okay cool are there any plans to monetize the devnet training material as of now, the, there's no, no plans. I, I log into DevNet and it's like zero dollars, zero dollars, zero dollars, and that's, it's awesome. And then I alt tab over to Cisco Learning Network and it's slightly more expensive. So I didn't know if they're. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, it's free. That's great. So that is actually one of the aims of DevNet is we don't want to restrict anybody from getting access. Like you said, there are kids out there, right? They're, they're, DevNet is expanding the scope not because we're Cisco because Cisco is open now to developers. And, and the learning labs also that uh, Ashutosh briefly mentioned, all the learning labs do connect into sandboxes as well. So if you're taking a learning lab, you don't have to have equipment at, ha at home to do it or go find access to it. The sandboxes connect directly into it. There are two types of sandboxes. One you can reserve, one is always on. So you can actually reserve your space and actually do things hands-on with there. Um, and one other point for DevNet Create that he mentioned, um, we did actually end up doing the the, um, the camp create, the camp create yes, this of year, course. and it was very successful. We had some, we had a good mix of uh, experiences in there. Some that were very new, hands-on, just getting started with uh, coding. Some of them were very well exper experienced. So it was a very good combination. People had a lot of learning. The learning curve was pretty steep for everyone. So there is possibilities and. The DevNet team does work extensively on uh, the younger generation projects and this and that. It's more right now based out of San Jose, but that is something that we are already looking um, for with a student ambassador program to, ex to spread it. Oh, yeah. Actually, so that's looking to kind of expand that like into the countries and whatnot. And absolutely. Like, like, actually, like, yeah, that's one thing that we recently launched is the student ambassador program. So uh, that's where, like, you know, what we're doing is taking a technology 
and like saying that hey uh, you are from let's say india you're from like kenya like we have a couple of countries that we've identified and those students are becoming they, they're understanding what that technology is uh, and they are like evangelizing devnet as part of that as well right so that they learn and then they tell other people to come in uh, with that and one last thing that i want to also mention is we do have devnet express events throughout the globe um, where they're taking, we actually train individuals to be able to deliver DevNet content in their regions and kind of expand their uh, horizon that way. They go through a series of training sessions and then they can go out and actually do their own sessions. Uh, we give them all the, the learning materials, everything that they need to go do their own session.